is in on and off. And when it's on, it's full blast. So if I leave my heater on overnight, um, people will melt. Uh, specifically Gabe, since the heater's right next to his room. I want to welcome you guys to Exodus. I want, you, want to thank you guys for being here. And it's a you know, quieter week and it's a quieter season, you know, as we come and just join together um, for Christmas. And, you know, many of you, some of you guys are back home. Some of you will be going home. I am going uh, after church up to the Bay Area to be with my parents. And it will be a quiet Christmas for me, which I'm thankful for. Um, and I just want to encourage you guys that, you know, really as we center in, as we step into Christmas, as we, you know, go through the season, right, it's coming two days away, to really engage and really to focus on Jesus during this time. Right? And, you know, there's a lot of crazy things that will be happening, or there's a lot of, you may have a lot of plans. Last night we had our Christmas cafe with the youth, which was crazy. You know, it was awesome. There's like 70, 80 teenagers just kind of running around and making a mess. And, but it was fun. It was really good. You know, but we need times to be quiet. Uh, we need times to reflect and sit and think and consider what is Christmas. What is Christmas, and what is the season, and what does it mean for me in my life, and how am I going to center myself around Christ? Right? And when Jesus was born, there were wise men, it said, that came from the east, and they carried with them gifts, you know, and they searched. Um, and some scholars will say that this journey took them a long time, months, years to plan in advance. They had an entourage. It wasn't just like three people walking out and knocking on the door. It was like, you know, probably a group of like 30 to 50 people, you know, the wise men and their people, right? And it was a huge deal. And they traveled all this distance just to bring Christ, you know, to see Christ and to bring Him gifts, to worship Him and to glorify Him. And they worked so hard. That was their focus, Christmas season, right? It was, you know, like, how am I going to find Christ, see Him, worship Him, glorify Him, and bring Him a gift? Right? It's Jesus' birthday, you know, and we're buying everybody else presents. And what are we bringing to Christ? And so I just want to encourage you to just consider that as we talk, as we go through um, today's, uh, today's message. Uh, before we go, I'd just like for us to spend some time praying. If, you, if you're new here, you know that we have a brother, uh, Galen, who is uh, recovering. Actually, he's in remission now um, from lymphoma. And we just want to continue to be praying for him and his healing. Um, and so, uh, if you would just all join with me together on um, praying, for, praying for him. Father God, Lord, we just continue to come before you. Lord, we want to be a body that will be obedient to you when you ask us to pray for those who are sick, um, especially those in our congregation, Lord. And so we want to lift up our brother Galen to you. Lord, and that the hope of Christmas, that the hope of Christ, Lord, may be real and present in his life and in Michelle's life during this time. Lord, we ask that you would continue to sustain him, continue to heal him, Lord, um, that he may recover well uh, through his last session of chemotherapy. God, and that he would just be able to also, in his spirit, no matter where he's at and how he's feeling, to rejoice and glorify you, Father God. We pray this for him and his wife, Michelle. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christmas songs, you know... I like Christmas because of Christmas songs. You know, my favorite Christmas song is Oh Holy Night. I would have led it in worship, but I can't hit that high note, right? And so it was like, you know, normally a lot of people can, so then it would be just singing, and then I'd like be like, Oh Holy Night, oh, oh Night, right? And then it would just sound really bad. So I never lead that song, or rarely ever try and lead that song, but, but it's my favorite song, you know? And I don't know if you guys have favorite Christmas songs, and you know, and favorite things about the season, but songs, music is a huge part of Christmas, right? Or at least our experience of Christmas. As soon as Thanksgiving is done, right, it is Christmas carols. And some people don't like it, and some people love it, right? Some people are like, oh man, turn on the radio, I want to hear some Christmas music. It gets me in the, you know, in, in the mood, right? And, um, 
And I think songs are also more powerful when you find out where they came from. You, songs are more powerful and meaningful when you know what the story was behind them. Right? We sang that desert song, and you know, and it's a song about a person in darkness and in this dark place, like still worshiping God. And it's so much more meaningful, I think, for me when I hear the story of the author. Right? And it's like, oh man, and this happened in my dark time. This happened after I lost my child. You know, that I was able to rejoice and sing <coughs> praise. Right? When, you know, when um, there's another song, you know, God of the City. Right? And it's a song that declares that God is over, you know, um, the city that, that these people were singing in. And, and the story behind that was it was a, it was a band from, from uh, Great Britain that went to Thailand. And they were actually playing in a bar, you know, along this street of, of um, brothels in Pattaya, Thailand. And as they were just playing there and worship, <coughs> worshiping God among this, like, really kind of... <clears throat> kind of dark place, you know, they just started singing, like, God, you are God over this place, even. Right? That you are still God, even in, you know, in this city where, you know, where sex is, like, overrun, right? Where there's child prostitution, where there's all this stuff here going on here. Like, God, you are still God of this city. You know, and these uh, stories make these songs more powerful, right? When you know the background. Amazing grace. Right? How sweet the sound. It was written by a captain, a ship captain, who used to be a, um, a slave trader. And he would ship slaves from, you know, from Africa you know, to, either, you know, to either England or, I don't know if he went to the U.S. Right? And so it's so much more meaningful when you hear those words, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know, this was a man who had engaged in things that were, you know, that, that he found horrible, right, once he knew Christ. And songs are so much more powerful when you know the background behind them, when you know not just the truth or what they declare, but also the story, right, also the story that comes up, the context of which the song comes. And so we're going to go, we're going to spend today, this morning, we're going to take a break, <clears throat> from our uh, spiritual disciplines um, and a series, and we're going to talk about the very first Christmas song that was ever sung. Um, actually, I need to point to you to uh, switch. And this song is found in Luke. And uh, if you have your Bible, you can open up to Luke. It's in Luke chapter 1, and it is a song known by many people uh, called the Magnificat. And it's called the Magnificat because it starts off with my soul glorifies the Lord and in, in Latin they will say magnifies and the Latin word is Magnificat so that's why it's called that. Uh, you can, I have it on a slide so you can go through and what I want to do is I want us to talk about not just the truth of the story because this is a song obviously about Jesus or this is a song in response to Mary's news and understanding of who Jesus is. And so there's truth statements in this song that I believe in Christmas time that we can hold on to for ourselves. And then there's another truth of, you know, the context of where Mary is singing from, right? Where the nation of Israel is at while she's singing that brings a bigger, a broader meaning to it, right? That we can hopefully, like, really see and accept and take in really the hope, the joy, and the glory of Christmas, of Christ's coming, and so it starts off with this. It says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. The first statement that Mary makes about Christ or about God as she is worshiping him concerning Christ is that he sees her. Right? That God knows exactly where she's at. He is mindful. That means within, you know, like the brain of God, within, you know, the knowledge and understanding of God, like he considers her. Right? She's not just some, 
you know, person that is like going on throughout life, right? But he actually is mindful of her. He considers who she is, he considers where she's at, and in her state, in her humble state. The same, I would say, is true for us. Right? That God is mindful of you. That God knows exactly where you're at. God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your situation and He considers you. He is considering you even now, as you sit here considering Him. Right? God is mindful of you. He sees you. He is intimately aware of who you are and where you are at. Where Mary was at, she was pregnant. She was pregnant and a virgin, which must have been hard for the people around her to understand. She was a teenager. Right? I can't imagine that this was an easy time for her. <coughs> You know, Jesus, an angel appears and says, oh, hey, you're going to have a baby. I don't think it's just like, oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> gotcha. Right? But look what she says next. It says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. I wouldn't exactly call teenage pregnancy, you know, the biggest blessing that you could find or have. And this, you, and we have to understand, like, when Mary accepted, you know, and when Mary heard this angel and accepted God's truth for her, right, she had to completely change the direction of her life and what she thought she was going to have and be and do. She had to change her thought of how family is going to look like. She had to change her idea of how, you know, how people are going to perceive her. She had to change all of these things, right, because of God's, you know, intervention. And yes, is it a blessing to be the mother of Christ? Of course it is. But it's not easy. But she declares that, you know, and, she, and you can see her kind of like, building up her faith and trust, right? God, you have totally changed the direction of my life. You have totally altered everything that I thought was going to happen from here. But as long as I know it's from you, I can trust that I am a blessed person because of that. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. Let me go to the next slide. It says this, He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. The next statements that Mary makes are over God's sovereignty and power. of how mighty he is and how strong he is to be over, you know, all of the things that were oppressing her, all of the things that were oppressing the Israelites as a people, right, rulers and authorities, people in their thrones, people who are proud in their thoughts. I think there's more going on here as well. I think Mary is declaring a trust that that Jesus is going to change all of this. Earlier, when the angel first came, I'll read it to you what he says about Jesus. He says this, Mary, he says this, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him a throne, give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. These were the words that the angel spoke to Mary about Christ. And so you can see that when Mary is singing these words, when she is saying these words about God's authority, 
about God's power over kings and, and, and thrones, right? A, a, about God's power to, against the proud and compassion for the humble. These are declarations of faith about the child that she is carrying. She's like, I am trusting that within this baby, right, this baby that I am carrying, that this is going to happen. And for us, right along with Christmas, along with the birth of Christ, we can put trust in a God who is sovereign, right, who is powerful, in whatever circumstance, right, whatever place that you're in. That it will, it is happening through Jesus Christ. And lastly, she ends with his compassion. It says this, he has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he promised our ancestors. And the last statements that she makes about God in this psalm, this is compassion. This is faithfulness. And I believe that we as believers, if we enter into Christmas, if we look at Christmas, if we see Christmas and if we see Christ, <coughs> There is a faithfulness of God that we can hold on to. Christ himself was a sign of faithfulness. This is the fulfillment of Abraham's of God's promise to Abraham is through Christ. And that he is merciful. And we, in the same way as the Israelites depended and trusted in God's promises, right, we also can trust in the same promises, in the same declarations of who Jesus is. That he is Savior, that he is Messiah, that he is a Redeemer. There's all of these statements, there's all of these truths that you know, are centered around Christ when we think about Christmas. There's all these things that we can hold on to for ourselves as we think about Christmas. And it doesn't matter if it's a happy time or a hard time, right? And for Mary, this was not an easy time. But it was in her, you know, even in her worry, even in her struggle, and right? she understood that, that Christ means something. He means the power of God being displayed, the authority of God being displayed. He means, you know, the compassion and faithfulness to his people. He means, you know, that God is mindful and watching and sees and knows where you're at. And then he means blessing. And so she trusts. She trusts in God's word when all she has to tr see for herself is a baby, right? A growing belly. But she puts so much faith and so much trust in what God has said about this child that she is carrying that it completely changes her attitude. That it completely, you know, rearranges the way that she thinks about her future. She thinks about her situation. She's like, man, I am blessed. And Elizabeth, you know, who she visits in 45, I think, says it's best, says, says this best. Blessed is she, or he, who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. 
God is in the process, I want to say, of fulfilling promises to you. That God has promised a whole slew of things as we approach and accept and see Christ as Lord our Savior. He has promised right, his kingdom. He has promised salvation. He has promised fruit you know, of the Spirit. He has promised redemption and transformation. And all of these things that God has promised through Christ to those that would call on his name. And we have the option during Christmas, we have the opportunity as we think about Christ, right, to accept these promises and say, blessed is he or she who believes, truly believes, truly trusts, truly, you know, truly grasps that God is fulfilling these things among you and in your lives. And as you approach Christ, God is fulfilling promises. Christ is the ultimate example, symbol, picture, person, experience, right, for us to realize that, for us to see that. That's amazing. That is really good news. And we're going to sing one. And I think, you know, we have circumstances, we have our own things going on in our own lives. We have difficult situations, I'm sure. But I would ask you, as we think about Christ, as we think about Christmas, that in the midst of our situations, we would be able to declare, you know what, God is fulfilling His promises to me. I am going to believe this. I am going to trust in this. I am going to allow my life to reflect what God is doing and what I believe God is doing for me and through me and to me. And I, I think it's a beautiful time. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, you see each one of us. You know where we're at. Lord, and you have plans, I know, for all of us as well. You have desires and you have things that you are doing in our lives, Lord, to draw us closer to you, to fulfill your promise, which is in you, Lord. And you are sovereign. You are over all circumstances, over all powers, over all oppressions, over all difficulties. And Lord, you are faithful. Lord, you are faithful and merciful, Lord, to your children, to those that seek after you. God, all of this is shown, shown to us through your Son and through the giving of your sending of your Son to, to us here on earth. And so I just pray, Lord, I pray that we would be able to declare our blessings in you and our trust in you as we look at Christ, as we see Christ, as we draw closer to Jesus, Lord, that we would, we would be able to declare our blessedness in you in spite of any circumstances and difficulties, Lord. I pray that this Christmas season will be filled with rejoicing. Rejoicing in who you are, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand? We're going to sing one.